Uh, thank you for finding your seats as we get started here this morning. Um, we do have our fall kickoff picnic today, just coming up uh, right after church. Hopefully the weather cooperates. I haven't been outside for the past hour. Is the weather looking okay? Are we going to be all right? It's looking pretty good out there. Good, good. That's good news. Okay, well, thank you for finding your seats as we start off today. Um, we do have connection cards available uh, for those who are new or visiting, or if you have a prayer request or something that you'd like to visit with a pastor about um, or have uh, our elders and staff pray for, fill out that connection card. Give us your name and address if you're new. Uh, you can find the connection cards in the bulletins out in the lobby, or you can find that connection card on our website or the QR code there, and then also on our app. So if you have any needs, prayer requests, or questions, fill out that connection card and help us to stay connected with you by giving us your contact information. And drop that off at the connection hub out these doors and to your left. Any visitors here today for the first time, um, fill out a card, bring it to the back table, connection hub, and they do have a free gift for you today if you'd like to. Uh, usually they're cookies and they're pretty yummy from what I'm hearing, so... Uh, stop by for a free gift there at the connection table. Uh, we are going to begin a project on roof repair this, um, this coming week, and I believe it's going to go for about two weeks, uh, in the back of the building, um, over the gym. If I'm not mistaken, we're going to have some major roof uh, repairs uh, going on. So we thank you for your continued generous giving and uh, your faithful support of the church here. If you're new, if you're... Uh, uh, familiar with the church, you can drop uh, any offerings in the boxes at the back of the sanctuary and by the main door, uh, or you can give online or um, also on our app. So the kickoff picnic is scheduled to begin right after service today, and we even have some inflatables for the kids as long as the weather holds. Uh, those bouncy houses, I, I haven't seen them yet, but it sounds pretty exciting. Can, so Can, um, can older people go on those too? Can uh, older people go on those? Wes wants to know if older people can go on the bouncy houses. I think they can. Think they can. <laughs> he says he thinks they can, so this could be exciting for everybody. So um, that is coming up right after church today. Fall annual meeting is coming up next Sunday, uh, the 25th, uh, right after church next Sunday, uh, discussing the 2022 and 23 budget uh, and presenting reports from the various ministries. Our missions weekend is coming up uh, early next month on um, October 7th, 8th, and 9th. The uh, uh, Envision France coordinator, I believe Tony Ruse, will be with us uh, and sharing uh, that Saturday night, October 8th. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of setting up, taking down, and, and attending, uh, just visit the Connection Hub uh, for the... Uh, Missions Weekend uh, International Celebration on Saturday night, the 8th. Also, the Parade of Nations that we do every year for our missions uh, convention and conference is going to be Sunday, October 9th. Uh, sign up in the lobby or at mahurch.net if you'd like to be a part of that parade. And um, I think we're in good shape there. And today is um, the beginning week or the official start date of our fall home groups, life groups, um, and look, there are some tables uh, right back here with some charts that will show you where those groups are. And Lord, um, we pray for our groups, we pray for our leaders. We ask your Lord to touch every person that's attending. May their hearts open wide to what you're doing in our church and in our lives. And Lord, we pray, Jesus, that... Um, you would give us more leaders. Help us, Lord, to find those who are willing and called. The harvest is ripe, and we pray for leaders that will bring in the harvest, Lord, not just in our church family and those in need, and those who are wanting to grow, but also in our neighborhoods and in our community. And we ask in Jesus' name. So stop on your way out at our um, life group table. See what's there. So, there's room in several of the groups for new, for new members yet. So uh, we have a video to, this morning uh, that we're about to play. Uh, we're going to let you watch this video, and uh, then I'll be back. 
So I was asked about um, what life groups are and a testimony, a personal testimony of um, how they've changed my life, how they've impacted my life. What I learned is that through, um, through the life group that you not just meet with people, you actually walk alongside people that um, have the same commonality of faith that you have. And I've been a part of a small group that is in youth group. Being a part of a small group has helped me to stay committed to the Lord. It's helped me grow in Christ by encouraging me to open up the Word. Um, it also is a great place to uh, develop uh, my spiritual gift. Our spiritual gift is something that we all should be using and it's all, they're all different. But how we develop that is by um, being around other followers. I learned so much about uh, not just the Bible, but um, how to live out the gospel on an everyday basis. And it is um, a decision you make every day, which is to die to self, which is to um, uh, which is to uh, follow the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So you may ask, why are we doing the things that we're doing in life groups? And how will that make my life different? I think it's so important for all of us to know our gifts, whether we're gifted in singing or cooking or mechanics or math. Knowing these gifts and using them for the benefit of other people is what gives us true joy and fulfillment in life. Uh, getting together not only to study the Bible, but to share each other's hearts, to make ourselves vulnerable, to know that we're doing the journey of life as a Christian disciple with a team, not just something we have to figure out on our own, but we have those who are like-minded and facing the same struggles, same challenges, and we're working this together, helping each other, picking each other up when we fall, encouraging each other when we do well. God bless you. Have a great day. Let's pray together as we begin this morning. <clears throat> Father, we pray for those who are ministering this morning, our worship team. We pray for those who are preparing for the picnic and the meal to follow. We pray, Lord, for um, all of those working in the various ways here in the church this morning. We pray for Pastor James as he presents the word to us today. We pray for our church family, Lord, for the changes that we're going through. Change is difficult. Change is hard. Sometimes even traumatic, Lord. But we, we look to you as our leader and guide, Father, we believe we're following your will for our church family. Help us, Lord, with the adjustments and the changes along the way. And we do pray that every family, every member, every new attender would have their personal needs, their spiritual needs, physical needs, and all that they need to flourish in life met as best we are able as a church family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we worship the Lord through song. And as we do, I just want to share a few words. Last Sunday, we, we left and we sang the solid rock. And we're in First Peter last week reading about Christ being the, the cornerstone, the foundation of the church is Christ. And throughout the week, I've just been thinking about Christ's words at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthews chapter 5 through 7. The very end of the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about the wise and foolish builders, right? The interesting thing about them is both of them hear his words. He says that the foolish builder is someone who hears his words but does not put them into practice. And he's a foolish builder who builds his house upon the sand. And when the rain comes and the wind blows, the house is destroyed, right? But then he talks about another person who hears his words and then puts them into practice. And he says that is the wise builder who builds his house upon the rock. And the winds came and the floods came and the house stood firm because it was built upon Jesus. And so it's just been bringing my mind to this song. It's a newer song we haven't sang on a Sunday morning, but it's just called Firm Foundation, and it's really based off of that. 
and celebrating the truth that Christ will not fail if we build our lives upon him. So if this is new to you guys, please just join in. If you know it, sing louder, okay, for those people around you that don't know it, so we can, we can learn this together. Let's just lift our voices to the Lord. Christ is my firm foundation the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus cause he's never let me down he's faithful through generations so why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my He won't. 
sing it again and again. I think of angels crying out to you day and night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth is full of his glory. You are worthy of it all, Lord. Worthy of all that we can bring you, which what in the world can we bring you, Lord? The holy God of, of heaven and earth, the one to whom all glory and honor and power and dominion is due. Lord, would you help us to do as we just sang? Would our lives scream, you are worthy of it all. Before our children, Lord, before our roommates, our neighbors, everything. So Lord, continue to do a work in us. We proclaim this in song because you are worthy. May we sit and receive your word now and wrestle with it because you are worthy. We pray in Jesus' name. Now is the time for kids first through fifth grade to go out into the lobby and follow me. We're going to go to Children's Church. So every week, right after worship, before the sermon, is when we'll dismiss those kids to come to Children's Church. And you'll see this slide every week. If you're not checked in, the parents can come with and check you in or stay with you during our time. All right, thanks. Well, good morning. Glad to have you here this morning. I don't know about you, but it's going to be a great morning. Worship has just been such an invitation into the Lord's presence this morning already. We get the privilege of opening up the Word, hearing what God has to say to us, and then what one of our favorite things to do later on is eat. We get to eat together, so I hope that you are prepared and ready and hungry. Um, it's been smelling so good outside and even into the church this morning, and uh, Rasan and the team has done a, another wonderful job of preparing for us to enjoy together. I'm so thankful for the gifts within the body, um, for the gifts of the worship team who lay, able to lead us in song and praise of God. If I were up here, it, it would not, Scripture says make a joyful noise, and that's exactly what it would be if I were leading us in worship. And I'm just so thankful for the different gifts within the body where we can serve together. And we can do this in community. We can do this together, collectively, corporately, but also experience that within life groups and the authentic community, pursuing a genuine relationship with God and with one another. And uh, I'm thankful for the video as well. Those that have participated and engaged and are pressing into life groups. We saw that uh, last week with the video from Barb and then some more today, and if you would like to join one of those life groups, see Pastor Ralph after the service. Stop by the tables uh, in the back, our life group information, a great way to participate and get plugged in together. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning as we prepare our hearts to hear from Him. Lord, we come into your presence. We thank you for this great privilege that we have to gather together to worship you, to lift your name on high, to open your word. We pray that as we open your word this morning, that Father, you would meet with us, that your spirit's presence would be made known in this place that your glory would be manifested among us, not for our sake, to make us look good, but to bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus. As we open your word, Father, speak to us. Meet us in this time. May we be challenged. May we be encouraged. Lord, may we fall even more in love with you and walk in a deeper relationship with you. We ask that you would do these things. Because we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose strong name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. We're continuing our series, Unshakable Kingdom Living in a Crumbling World. And so if you have your Bibles, we're in 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 9 through 12 this morning. We're going to be looking at verses 9 through 12. We have that on the screen for you. If you are watching at home or you're online, you're traveling you're watching that online. I hope you uh, have a device or a Bible in front of you where you can also follow along, but it's also on the screens for you this morning. First Peter chapter nine, or chapter, First Peter chapter two, verses nine through 12. We're going to see Peter's continuing what it means to be a follower of Jesus. What does it mean to live a Christian life, to be a follower of Jesus in a crumbling world, in a world where there is just opposition to the way of Jesus? He's talking about what it means to be a disciple. A disciple is one who's called by Christ into a loving relationship with Christ for the purpose of becoming like Christ while on mission with him. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. Peter continues, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you, as aliens and strangers in the world, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. As we've been walking through 1 Peter, we're now into the middle of chapter 2. Peter has continuously shown us from God's Word what it means to be a follower of Jesus. He's writing to believers. He's writing to Christians. And he's showing us and those that he was writing to what it means to follow Jesus in a world that just opposes the way of Jesus I want to ask you a question this morning, and I want you to kind of wrestle with it for just a moment. Who are you? If we were to engage in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and I asked you that question, who are you, what would your response be? Now, I think for many of us, we would stay on the surface level, and we would say, my name is so-and-so. I'm, I'm James Cameron. And then we would usually attach what we do to that question. I'm James Cameron, and I'm a pastor. That's who I am. If I would ask Emmer, Emmer would say, I'm Emmer Shields, and he would tell me, most likely, what he does for a living. If I would ask each one of you, you would usually respond in that way. This is my name. This is what I do. And that is how we kind of identify ourselves. But Peter is saying it goes so much deeper than that, and he's going to give us kind of a crash course a little bit of our identity. Because we are so much more than just our name and then our occupation. Sometimes we attach sports teams to who we are. I'm a Bears fan. And I knew that was the response that was going to come up. We'll just see about that later tonight. I'll still be a Bears fan. Maybe some of you will join me. <laughs> come to the winning side. Um, but we usually attach other identifying pieces to, de to define 
who we are. And Peter says, I'm going to give you an identity. I'm going to reveal the identity of who you are in Christ Jesus. And so he's going to talk about identity, who you are. He's going to talk about uh, the instructions of what it means to follow Christ. And then later on, we're going to look at the implications. So who you are, what you need to do, and why you need to do it. The first piece that Peter gives us is our identity, who you are. Let's look at uh, verse 9 again, the first part. He says, but you are a chosen people. Writing to these believers and to us, he says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Last week, we looked at how Peter described us as as like living stones. We were being built into a spiritual house together, into a holy priesthood, where we were to offer spiritual sacrifices, holy and pleasing and acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Peter really wants these believers to understand their identity in Christ Jesus. Understanding our identity is critical to our spiritual maturity. In verse 9, Peter says, Uh, We have this identity, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. And he identifies four pieces of our identity, highlighting our position as believers. Let's look at that first one, a chosen people. He says you are a chosen people. You are different. We have to go back to last week's passage where Peter's talking about Jesus as the living stone, and then the, the living stone is actually a stumbling stone to those who don't believe. To those who don't follow Jesus, Jesus is a stumbling stone because they disobey the message. And Peter says, but you, saying you're not like them, you're separate from them, well, I'm contrasting the two, Peter says you are a chosen people. You've been called by Christ into a loving relationship with him for the purpose of becoming like him while on mission with him. As we looked at the Old Testament several times last week, Peter continues this thought. He says, just like the people of Israel in the Old Testament were chosen by God to be his people, we, through the new covenant, under under the new covenant through Jesus Christ, have been called to be God's people. Peter, Paul, and James... All throughout Scripture in the New Testament repeatedly call believers God's chosen people. God wants a relationship with us. Alliance pastor and author Rob Reamer, who who wrote Soul Care, he says, God doesn't love us. God doesn't love us because of who we are or what we do. God loves us because of who he is and what he has done, which makes God's love for us and our foundation unshakable. God loves us not because of who we are or what we've done, but because of who he is and what he has done, which makes God's love for us and our foundation unshakable. God chose us to be his. We are a chosen people. The second thing that Peter says is that we are a royal priesthood. In the Old Testament, the people of God were often described as a nation chosen by him to serve as a priesthood. As we saw last week, Peter says that this applies to us as well. This applies to believers, that we are a holy priesthood. Peter here in chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, he says we are a royal priesthood. We are a royal priesthood, which, which not only defines our identity as priest, but we're also a royal priesthood. Because Jesus is king and we are co-heirs with Jesus, there's this sense that we reign with him. We are a royal priesthood. We serve together. We serve as ministers of the new covenant to the world. Paul puts it a little bit differently. He says we are Christ ambassadors representing Jesus Christ to the world around us. And as royal priests, we offer spiritual sacrifices. We serve God. We obey him. We proclaim Jesus to the lost and we disciple the found. We declare God's redemptive plan to a world that is lost. Which means within the church, we all share in the work that he's called us to do. I want us to really wrestle with this piece as well. 
Friends, it's not just the pastors and elders and lay leaders and those that are teaching children's church this morning, not just those that are out cooking the food so we can all share together. It's not just a select few that are called to minister and serve. We together, corporately and collectively, are a royal priesthood who are called to be in service to God, to glorify him, to use the gifts that he has given us through the empowerment of the Spirit within each one of us, to bring glory and honor to Him and to serve one another. And then to take the message of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Friends, together we serve. It's not me serving. It's not just you serving. It's us together as a body coming together, being built into a spiritual house to offer spiritual sacrifices that are holy, pleasing, and acceptable to God. Peter says that we are a royal priesthood. We serve together because God's presence lives within us. We partner together. There's the sense of divine anticipation, which is actually the first core value that we have at Menominee Alliance Church. We highly value divine anticipation. We are exceedingly confident that God is at work in us and through us to accomplish his purposes. And we together are coming together collectively as a royal priesthood with an expectation and exceeding confidence that God is at work in us and through us to accomplish his purposes. And we just want to partner with him in that work. Friends, do we have that sense of divine anticipation? Do we have a sense that God is at work all around us, in our community, in our homes, in our country, that God is at work. No matter what we see on the other side, no matter the opposition that we face, we have an expectation, an anticipation that God is at work. And as royal priests serving him together, we want to be about the Father's business. We're exceedingly confident that God is at work in us and through us to accomplish his purposes. Peter says... You are a royal priesthood. The third thing he says, part of our identity, is we are a holy nation. God had called Israel to be a holy nation, to be a people set apart from sin and set apart to him, to be his representatives to the world. We're to be a holy people. Holiness is not just being set apart from sin in the world, but it's also being devoted to God and his mission to be used by him. We become his vessels. We're to be holy because he is holy. We are to be a holy people, a people who belong to him. We live in righteousness. We're to live in righteousness, being transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus while fulfilling his mission to proclaim the good news to those who are lost. We're to be a holy nation. We're to be known as being set apart from sin and devoted to God. We're a holy nation, but we're also a people belonging to God. A people belonging to God. Maybe in your version of the Bible it says a peculiar people. Peculiar means God's purchased possession. Peter says that we together as the body of Christ are God's purchased possession. We were bought at a price, a great price, the price of God's one and only son. Paul, as he's talking to church leaders in Acts chapter 20. It says this, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Friends, I want us to pause on this for a moment as we talk about our identity, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. We must understand that we were bought at a high price. We were bought by the blood of Jesus, which means we have great value, and great worth, not because of who we are or what we've done, but because of who God is and what he's done for us. We are a peculiar people, a people belonging to God. We belong to him. We were bought with his blood. We don't live for ourselves. We live for him. And our response is one of submission and surrender. Church family, your life is not your own. You were bought at a price. You belong to God. We are a temple of the living God. Corinthians says, I will live in them. God speaking to Paul. He says, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. We are a chosen people, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. This is our identity. And friends, we must walk in that identity. Having a deep understanding of who we are in Christ helps us as we walk in relationship with him. The second thing Peter says is this, instructions, this is what you're to do. Knowing who you are and then understanding what it is you are to do will help you in your walk with Jesus. Let's look at verse 9, the second part. Peter says, this is your identity, this is who you are, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Peter's going to give us three things in this very short passage of what it is that we're to do as followers of Jesus. And the first is this, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Friends, we are to declare the praises of God. We're to praise him for who he is and what he's done. We're called to worship him and glorify him. A.W. Tozer said, I believe a local church exists to do corporately what each Christian believer should be doing individually, and that is to worship God. We are saved to worship God. Tozer says, I believe that the church together, corporately, should be doing, and it exists to do what we as individuals should already be doing, and that's to worship God. He says, the reason that we're saved is not to save us from our sins so that we can have eternity with Jesus. The reason that we're saved, Tozer says, is we are saved to worship him. John Piper says that missions exist. Missions exist because worship does not. We're saved to worship God. We declare his praises. Our identity has been given to us so that we may make his identity known to all people. Our identity has been given to us so that we may make his identity known to all people. We worship and glorify him. The second thing Peter says is to abstain from sinful desires. Look at verse 11. Peter says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Friends, kingdom living in a crumbling world demands that we abstain from the sinful ways of the world. Peter exhorts us to live apart from sinful desires that surround us. To abstain means to, to hold oneself constantly back from. We understand what this means in the context of alcohol. We abstain from alcohol means we don't participate, we don't drink, we don't taste alcohol, we don't pursue it. To abstain from sexual immorality means we're not going to engage in sexual relationships outside of God's covenant of marriage. We're going to keep our mind and our eyes and our bodies pure. We understand what it means to abstain from something. Peter here says, friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers, this is not your home. You're set apart from the world. You're following Jesus. You're becoming more like him. Abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Abstain from sinful desires. Have no part in it. Keep yourself constantly back away from it. He says these sinful desires, they war against your soul. There's a battle within. We're being made into the image and likeness of Jesus. We're being made holy because of what Jesus has done in us and through us. And yet, there's a battle. These sinful desires linger. Friends, this is a spiritual battle. It's not a battle that you can fight in your own strength. This is a battle that requires surrender and submission and a leaning on the Holy Spirit in your life. Peter says, abstain from sinful desires which battle against your soul, which war against it. Friends, our lives and our actions must be changed by Christ. We must experience an inward transformation a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Peter listing a list of sins, and he said, get rid of these. Rid yourselves of these sins. And now he's continuing us to continue in this process of abstaining. Abstain from the sinful desires which war against your soul. Don't be like the world. Don't put yourself in a place or a situation where you will entertain sinful desires. Don't do it. 
If alcohol is the sin that easily entices and drags you down, you've got to learn how to abstain from it, which means you don't put yourself in a situation where that becomes a temptation. If you're dealing with another sin, you don't put yourself in a situation where you're tempted by it, where you don't put yourself in a place where you're going to entertain the thought. Don't put yourself in a place where you allow yourself to entertain sinful desires even if you never act on them. Friends, we can't abstain without the Holy Spirit working in us. Walk in his power. Paul, in writing to Titus in Titus chapter 2, says this. Very similar along the lines of what Peter's saying. Paul says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Paul here is echoing the words of Peter. It's the Holy Spirit within us, teaching us to say no to these sinful desires so that we can become a purified people, a people that belong to God, eager to to do what is good. Peter says, praise God, worship him, declare his praises, abstain from sinful desires, and then he says this, live good lives. Let's look at verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans. Friends, the work the Spirit does in us, the work that the Spirit does in us should be evidenced through us. We're to live good lives. We're to do what is right and good. The inward transformation that the Spirit brings should be noticeable to those around us. We're to live good lives. Paul again says the same thing in Ephesians chapter chapter 2. He says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We are created to do good works. It's not the good deeds that save us or bring right standing before God, but it's a, it's a fruit. It's an outflowing of what God does in us that should be evidenced in our lives. We are created to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Friends, live such good lives. Now, why does Peter say that we're to worship God? Why does he say that we're to abstain from sinful desires? Why does he say that we're to live such good lives? What are the implications Peter's talked about our identity. He's given us instructions of what we're to do, the implications, why you are to do it. Let's look at verses 9 and 10 again. Peter says that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. He says, once you were not a people. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Friends, why do we live this way? Why do we live this Christian life? Because we've received God's mercy. He has called us out of darkness into his wonderful life. Look at the, what God has done in your life. Look at what he's done. Look at who you used to be. You once were in darkness, separated from God, separated from him by your sinfulness. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Peter here, he's quoting again from the Old Testament. And he's quoting a really unique and interesting passage. He's quoting from the prophet Hosea in Hosea chapter 2. Now Hosea is a prophet who had been instructed by God to go and marry an unfaithful woman. He was instructed to go and marry a prostitute and start a family. Wild. Read through Hosea. Look at what God calls him to do. And he does it. He obeys and he marries this woman who is unfaithful to him over and over and over again. And it's a picture of Israel's relationship with God, her unfaithfulness to God. And they have children, and Hosea names the children different things, and the names are really significant and have great meaning. One is, you are not my people. One is, you are not loved. Representing Israel's heart to the Father. But God speaking to Hosea here says, I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called not my loved. And I will say to those, not, those called not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. God is speaking of his people. 
of how he would restore them. And those that had not been his people would be his people. And those that had not been loved would be loved. Peter here is quoting from Hosea. And he says, I will plant. I will do these things. You did not used to be my people, but now you are my people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Friends, look at what God has done for you. He has saved you. He has redeemed you. He has set you apart. Once you were far from him, but now you have experienced his mercy and grace. Once you lived in darkness, now you live in his wonderful light. And our proper response, our proper response to receiving God's mercy is to become a holy people. To become a holy people, to declare his praises, to worship him, to offer spiritual sacrifices. Why? Why does Peter say we need to have an unshakable faith? Why does he say we have to live in the kingdom in the midst of a crumbling world? Here's one reason. Here's one reason. Verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Church, we proclaim Jesus Christ with our lives. The way that we live shows Jesus in us. Jesus said in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Peter says, do these things based on your identity in Christ. These are the ways that you're to live. And doing so, this is the result. This is what happens. Church, we are to proclaim the gospel by the way we live it out. That's our task. That's our responsibility. That is what Peter is driving home. This is what we need to take and apply. Kingdom living in a crumbling world requires that we live differently than the world around us. Peter says, live in such a way that even the people who despise you, even the people who persecute you, even the people that hate you, they may end up praising God because of the way that you live. Friends, your life is a testimony to what God has done. Live your lives in such a way that those who do not know Jesus see Jesus in you. I'm going to have the worship team come. We're going to close with the song, Thank You, Jesus, for the blood. Thanking Jesus, praising him for what he's done for us. But as we sing this song together, I want us to really wrestle with this this morning. Are our lives a representation, a reflection of what Jesus has done for us? Are we living in such a way that we are following and obeying what he's called us to do? And are we living our lives in such a way that in everything we do and say, we point to Jesus? Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. You've given us a new identity. And Father, may we walk in that identity. May we walk as a chosen people, as a royal priesthood, as a holy nation, as a people that belong to God so that we can offer praise and glory to Jesus for what he's done for us. May we abstain from the sinful desires which war against us and may we not try to do that in our own strength, but may we rely on the Holy Spirit to do that in and through us. And may in all things, may we live such good lives that those who don't know you see Jesus. May our words and may our deeds reflect Jesus in all things. May we not become so consumed with establishing an earthly kingdom that we fail to live in the kingdom of God. May we pursue you in all things. We ask this in the strong and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. I remember who I was 
I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your side. So you made a way across the great divide. There behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe. Broke my chains, freed my soul. For the first time I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of fire. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into a glorious light. You took my place. Laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Wash me white. Thank you, Jesus. You have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. There is nothing strong. praise you for that truth that we just sang, that we just read from your word, that you brought us from the darkness and, and brought us into your kingdom of your light. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for what you've done for us, Lord. May we go in, in that thought, Lord, of what you've done for us and go in joy because we can know that your blood is enough, that faith in, in what you have done for us is enough, not in what we've done for you, but in what you've done for us. May we go in that thought, Lord. 
We praise you for this morning as well, that we're having this time of celebration. We thank you for those who throughout the weekend and even before the weekend have been planning and this morning making food for us. And we just give you thanks, Lord, for this meal and for this time where we get some extra time to linger and connect with one another, to enjoy the kids having fun on the bounce houses and whoever else wants to too. But Lord, would you bless us as we go, bless this food to us and this meal and the fellowship that we're about to have. In Jesus' name, we lift it up. All God's people said, amen. <laughs>